quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, the bread is prepared and the children are gathered together at the table of the Lord. Father, we ask for your divine feeding of us now as we partake together in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to take one minute to introduce myself for those who do not know me. My name is Gary Roverino. I have a pen name that I also go by, G. John Rove, and I uh, wrote a book called Concealed from Christians for the Glory of God, where you'll see my pen name. That grew into a YouTube channel that is called uh, Above God's Name from Psalms 138.2, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Here's the channel icon. This is the book I wrote. All of that grew into what is now today the 1611 King James Bible Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. Praise the Lord. His grace has raised all of this up. I want to give you a quick testimony. Uh, I was in my 20s. I was not raised in a Christian home. And I met the Lord Jesus and I never recovered. He raised me in the gospel of his grace. And then about 12 or 13 years or so into my walk, I had another great meeting of the Lord Jesus. It was the King James Bible. And I threw out my treasured New American Standard Bible. And the Lord poured out wisdom and understanding and knowledge of this King James Bible, even unto granting me the King James Bible Museum that stands today, which is reaching many hungry souls. I raised that up with Howard Elseth, him and I. I'm the young man, he is the old man, and we together, uh, through great love, uh, are laboring there in Arizona. God has appointed me I'm called of God to be set for the defense of the King James Bible, and my entire life is committed toward that fulfilling of the course of that ministry. Amen. Amen. And I am here to demonstrate to you today that endowment that God has put within me to, through the relationship that I have with Him, receive understanding of the counsel of His Word that He has raised up which we know as the 1611 King James Bible. So I'm going to begin taking us here to Hebrews 4.12. We all know really, really well this scripture. For the word of God is quick. Christians everywhere say they believe this scripture. Well, when I press into them, I find out that they don't believe it as deeply as they think that they do. For the word of God is quick, is an incredible statement. Now, the scriptures use the word quick in the King James Bible in contrast to dead. Quick and dead, Acts 10.42. Quick and the dead, 2 Timothy 4.1. Quick and the dead, 1 Peter 4.5. The last words of Jesus Christ in Revelation, I come quickly. What happens? Yea, two chapters before that. Revelation 19, the Lord returns. You want a picture of the definition of the word quickly? You read Revelation 19 and you look at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ with the armies of heaven. That's quick. That is quick. The Bible is always going to supply you. It is a picture book, a picture to go with the teaching. And I tell you, when Jesus Christ returns on that day, there will be many quick and dead. So we're going to talk about how the scriptures are living. When we pick up a Bible as we know it, a King James Bible, We're holding something that is both natural in our hand and supernatural in our hand. 1 Corinthians 15 says there is a natural body 
and there is a spiritual body. And we do not evaluate, even ourselves, the scriptures well enough to really comprehend that there is a DNA to the words of this book that are in the spirit. In other words, that which is a spirit still has a DNA. Though it be invisible itself as the spirit is invisible itself. We're going to examine that DNA today that so often is an overlooked concept. Consequently, it's leading people to think that anywhere and everywhere and anything that calls itself a Bible has been issued by God and possesses that spiritual DNA from the Father. Not so. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. See that? After his kind. This is a major clue. Whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. This book has been self-replicating itself from the beginning because it is a living word. Its natural body, what we hold in our hand today, has been the replication of its spiritual body, its spiritual DNA. And I'm going to demonstrate all of this to you mightily today. After his kind, whose seed is in itself. Now take a look where God says this. It's so genetic, this book, that even where God places that terminology to describe the nature of the living, he puts genes 1-1-1, Genesis 1-11, after its kind. You see that one right there? Look at what that one's begetting. A one. That one is begetting a one. This is gene theory right here. And God is showing you after its kind. That's why a one follows it. After its kind. That's why a one follows it again. God is not only in the words, the letters. He's in the numbers. He's in it all. He didn't just write the words of God. He completed the book of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Look at this. God has anointed my eyes. Genes. Genesis 1-7. When God finished the Bible in its destination language of English, He mastered every form of literary device in this book. This is the greatest book ever written, and God is the preeminent author of all time. And here you're seeing what is called his demonstration of the usage of the homophone, a word that can be spelled differently but pronounced the same as another word. And it was so, S-O-W, so. This is the first time God uses the word so, and he uses it as a homophone here. In Genesis 1, 7, and look what he follows it by. Boom. You see that period? That's a seed to God. He put the image of a seed right there. And it was so, S-O, homophone for S-O-W, sowing and reaping. This entire book is a matter of God's divine sowing and reaping. The seed is perfect, there. For the harvest is perfect. Amen. That's a mustard seed to be exact. Because this is a book of faith. Amen. Amen. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. You see how this is following the sowing instruction? And whenever you have anything living... It must replicate itself according to this concept right here. When your DNA, when you were sown a seed, immediately what began was a self-replicating process. And your DNA was writing line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Members, members of his book. This is why... You must interpret the Bible as it has been written and developed by the Lord. 
This is revealing to you the nature of the Bible. Absolutely, this is teaching you how and instructing you how to understand the Bible, but it is also revealing the nature of the Bible. There's never conflicts with God. When he says something here on the one hand, he's going to reinforce it over here on the other hand. Now we're going to deal with two words here. Bear with me. Because when we talk about the living, Hebrews 4.12, and we're talking about there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, we are talking about the Bible issuing itself out of itself. And that, in human language, is called mitosis and meiosis. Now, mitosis is cell division identicality. When a cell divides to reproduce itself exact to its original, meiosis is cell division where there is slight differentiation. Now, these are going to be the two ways that God then perpetuates the scriptures through their own growing spiritually as a spiritual organism. Now, here's an example of mitosis because I want you to really get this. Here's the entire Bible searching for the word crown. The word crown self-replicates itself 66 times in your Old and New Testament. Does that mean something to everyone in here? Your 66 books of the Bible? Do you know when they were crowning the Lord Jesus Christ with the crown of thorns, that his perception was that he was being crowned as the 66 books of the canon? He received it because he had a spiritual strength to interpret his circumstances for what they really, really were. He was wearing, yes, a crown of thorns, but in his heart, he knew the Gentiles had just crowned him as the word of God because he had walked the walk of the man of God. And now he had finished that walk and God was ordaining him for who he was. Now he would go to the cross. Amen. That's mitosis. It's an exact cell reproduction. Meiosis is very similar, yet a difference appears. Now here we have meiosis occurring as the scriptures are growing out of themselves. The just shall live by his faith, Habakkuk 2.4. When Romans 1.17 expresses Habakkuk 2.4 through the apostle Paul, we see that it's nearly identical, and yet there is a differentiation. The just shall live by faith. Because something new was emerging. What we know through Galatians 2.20 to be not his faith, faith as in Habakkuk's faith or any man's faith of our own individually, but faith, the faith of the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Something of meiosis had taken place. So we see a slight differentiation. The scriptures are growing out of themselves. Habakkuk 2.4 was growing into Romans 1.17 through meiosis. Now, meiosis determines the gender. So you can have a father and a son look alike, same gender, but you can have a father and a daughter look alike. They look alike because of mitosis, yet one is a girl because of meiosis. And we see that God did that with the 1611 King James He and She Bible. And we don't have time to teach on that right now today. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, you can understand that this was actually an act of God, of meiosis, to bring about this gender from this gender right here. He and she. Now, interesting enough, as God has perfected the English language to be the destination language for his Bible, since we're talking about code, DNA, look at the word mitosis. It has IT in it. We say, you're going to have to contact your IT department to get that solved. Right. IT is your information technology department. You're dealing with DNA when it comes to this book in the spirit realm. Information technology. Meiosis 
it switches to OS. Now, this is standard computer talk today for operating system. I could even take the infamous iOS if I wanted to include the i. iOS for iPhone operating system. Just saying, just saying. You see how this is built into the words? The letters are built in right there. The communication is built in right there. Everything's built in with God. Now, we're going to look at cell division, and I'm going to demonstrate cell division and how this book grew out of itself. I'm going to use this partial list right here. We're going to look at testament to testament. That would be from Old Testament to New Testament. Author to author. That would be, for example, one author, and then it appears with another author. Chapter to chapter, and we're going to look at book to book. We're going to cover these, and we're going to go through them fairly quickly because it's a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to depend on your knowledge of the scriptures to be able to follow along, that you're familiar with the places in the Word of God that we're going to be covering. We looked at this already. Now this, I just want to recapture for you to let you know that what you saw was testament to testament. Now this is by and large what we're used to when we interpret the Bible precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We saw Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. Then we saw in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith, Romans 1.17. Paul is going to supply that to be the faith of Jesus Christ in the believer. That is an example of testament to testament, mitosis and meiosis, a combination we could say. Now we're going to go into author to author right now. This is going to start to get with each each example, I'm going to get deeper and deeper, knowing that you can follow along as you're growing in your understanding of this. John 11, 25, 26, Jesus says this. He says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now take a look as this grows and manifests from the Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, how it's going to have a traceability to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Yellow matching yellow, aqua matching aqua. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Now see, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It's manifesting. The cell nature is manifesting for growth. Amen. Then, in the aqua, then which we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. Isn't that going to be a generation that will not see death? You see that? That's going from author to author. But wait, it's going to come back to John. Now take a look at this. Because what that John 11 passage did is it grew into 1 Thessalonians 4 where it picked up and lent its information and is continuing a growth cell reproduction path. John's going to have two experiences in Revelation in the early chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 4. We're going to look at each of those, experience 1 and experience 2. You will compare the colors. We saw 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Look at what John says here. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we had a great voice with a shout with the voice of the archangel. John's experience, a great voice as of a trumpet. It's pulling it out of the 1 Thessalonians 4 and with the trump of God. The trump is the sound that the trumpet makes. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me. And here we have a match with, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What's happening to John is the similitude of the prophets. John is experiencing a similitude of the dead in Christ right here being raised. 
Jesus is going to say, fear not, and he's going to raise him to his feet. That is similitude number one. When we go to his second experience in Revelation 4, 1 and 2, we see that what Jesus spoke in John 11 that pulled its way through to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 started to manifest itself in its first application in Revelation 1. Now its second half is being manifested in Revelation 4. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard there's that shout with the voice of the archangel, was as it were of a trumpet, there's the trump of God, talking with me, which said, come up hither, there's the translation, and I will show thee things which must hereafter. And immediately, I was in the spirit. Immediately. You see, he's bypassing death in this second experience, whereas in the first experience, he was as a dead man. The dead in Christ shall rise first is John's first experience. And now in Revelation 4, his second experience is we which be alive shall be caught up together with the Lord. All right? It looks like this. And you want to be thinking as if you're looking at a cell path here of the mitosis and the meiosis experience that is happening in the development of the scriptures. Like a flow chart here, and you see how it goes from the words of Christ. It pulls through the words of Paul to gain more force, and then it returns to John. When it returns to John, it splits, and a meiosis takes place, and in between come the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. This is very curious. And that leads to the question, why? Why is there an exhibition of the church, the seven churches, and all of that content directed toward the Jews preceded and followed with the translation of the church? And the answer to this is what's called anisotropy or an anisotropic structure. Remember, it's a living book. It's doing living Features. The exhibition, this is what anisotropic is, the exhibition of different property values when viewed from different directions. When I view it this way, I'm seeing one thing. When I cross channel, I'm seeing something else. So you want to think in terms scripturally as to what God is doing in this as a Romans 16 type of of contribution, or in Ephesians 3, 9, type of contribution. To the Jew first, this is why we see so much dominant Jewish application in the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. But we still have this, and also to the Greek, the fellowship of the mystery. There is a fellowship taking place in Revelation 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it's an anisotropic fellowship. This is why when we view it in certain ways, there's such glaring connections to all of the cellular connections in the Old Testament regarding Israel. And yet, do we not see conflict in speech among the wider aspect of the body of Christ that are claiming we see things regarding the church here? Is it one or the other? Is it conflict or is it anisotropy? I'm going to tell you that it's anisotropy. Particularly, God has worked the anisotropic structure into gemstones. Now, this is the title page from the 1611 King James Bible. Look at what he does. Genesis, Ezra, Matthew. Those are your first books of the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament. You got a gem right there. He takes that because gems and gemstones are by and large, though not all, and definitely not all, isotropic in nature, which means when you're looking at them at one angle, you're going to see one thing. And when you look at them from another angle, you're going to see another thing. And he takes that all the way through 
to the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. You see all of those stones in the new Jerusalem? Those are all anisotropic stones. This proves to you that God is building with anisotropic stones. And that the precious stones that are being built into us are also anisotropic stones. And this will require us to view the scriptures with this quality of anisotropy in mind. This is what I submit humbly to the body of Christ. Now we're going to look at chapter to chapter here. I'm going to go quickly through this. And I want you to see the cell divisions that's taking place because not is it only from a testament to testament or going from John and then coming through 1 Thessalonians and then going to Revelation. This type of cell division is taking place immediately. No sooner is it written in John 10 that in John 11, it's all coming to fruition as cellular reproduction because the word of God is quick. It is living. Amen. Here we go. Pay close attention or you'll miss this. John chapter 10, we're on the heels of John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, there is a blind man coming out of darkness. We enter John chapter 10 on the heels of John chapter 9. When we go into John chapter 11, we have another man coming out of darkness. We have Lazarus coming out of a dark tomb. A blind man is a tomb of darkness. If you shut your eyes, you can have the sensation that you are in within yourself in a tomb, literally. And Lazarus was literally in a tomb. Look at Isaiah 42, 7, to open the blind eyes, that's the blind man of John 9, that were leaving to go into John 10, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Lazarus in the tomb is a form of sitting in a prison house. John 10 is all about the sheepfold. That grows in mitosis into John 11 to be the tomb. You see the similarity? A sheepfold, a tomb. Here we go. What's in the sheepfold? The sheep of Jesus are inside the sheepfold all through John chapter 10. In John chapter 11, there is one single sheep, Lazarus, inside awaiting the shepherd. He is inside awaiting Jesus. Look what Jesus says in John 10, 3. To him the porter openeth. Look at what he says in John 11, 39 and 41. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. They do that, and he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Amen. You compare that. To him the porter openeth. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. This is all cellular reproduction, going from John 10, cellularly reproducing because the word of God is living. Here we are again, John 10, 3. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Compare that with John 11, 43 and 44. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He's calling his sheep by name. He's literally calling his sheep by name. And he that was dead came forth. It is proving to you that it is literally calling his sheep by name. Because when he said Lazarus, you know how many dead people could have come out of the ground? There could have been thousands and thousands and thousands of Lazarus coming out of the ground. Right. But only one came forth because he was calling his own sheep by name. Amen. When those sheep <laughs> see Lazarus, we could say, <laughs> they're saying he's one of us. You picture Lazarus coming out of that tomb and you're looking at a white sheep coming out because he was wrapped in graven clothes. You literally have a picture of it right there reproducing. John eleven forty four, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Amen. Amen. This is uncanny because it is cellular reproduction. I'm going to throw in a teachable moment here. We like to say that to our kids. We say, this is a teachable moment, guys. And we share something because if you can only see the scriptures in the letters without the images, you will miss some of the greatest teaching that God can give you. This is a picture of the sheep coming out of the sheep gate. Look at Song of Solomon 6.6. 6. Thy teeth 
are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing. You know, you're constantly washing your teeth when your mouth is closed. Your saliva is washing your teeth. Whereof every one beareth twins. See how beautiful her teeth are? And there is not one barren among you. But beware, because if the sheepfold is not what comes forth, but the tomb opens up and the tongue comes out, instead of those beautiful sheep, the serpent comes forth. Amen. Keep that tomb closed until Jesus says, Amen. take away the stone. Amen. You know what that translates to in instruction? Teachable moment, guys. Don't speak unless the Lord is telling you to speak it. Amen. You will avoid a lot of damage that way. Back to John 10 and 11. John 10, 6. You have confused Pharisees in John chapter 10. My, mitosis and meiosis in John 11, we have confused disciples. Same thing. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Compare that with John 11. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Confusion in John 10, confusion in John 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He reveals he will give his life for the sheep, all of the sheep. In John 11, Jesus reveals he will give his life for Lazarus, one of the sheep. In John 11, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He, that's Lazarus. He, Lazarus, that believeth in me. Though he were dead, yet shall he, Lazarus, live. And it's carried out right there in the next chapter. I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus speaks bold words regarding the shepherd. And then in John 11, he walks in his bold words. Look at what he says. I lay down my life for the sheep, John 10, 15. In 11, 8, it says, His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus was going in the boldness of the good shepherd, willing to lay down his life. Jesus speaks bold words regarding the sheep this time. We see that in John 10. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And then in John 11, the Spirit speaks through Caiaphas bold words regarding the sheep. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. You remember he prophesied that? He's prophesying according to John 10 because the words he's speaking are the meiosis of the Scriptures coming forth. This spiritual body was replicating itself to become the words of God. Pharisees demand plain speech. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Look in John 11. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. This is all match for match, guys. You ever read John 10 and John 11 this way? Ever seen anything like this? Pharisees believe not that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly, 1036, I am the Son of God. Compare that with Mary, who believes that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God. She saith unto him in 1127, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Why is all of this echoing? Why is John 11 echoing John 10? Because the scriptures are growing. They're literally growing. The Pharisees heard the words and believed not in John 10. In John 11, the Jews saw the works and believed. I told you and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. Those works were then coming on the heel of those words in John 11, where we read in verse 45, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. What believing now look at this. The Pharisees took up stones to send a man into a tomb. When you pick up a stone to stone a man, your desire is for that man to enter the tomb. Look what Jesus says in John 11 through that cellular reproduction. 
Jesus takes away the stone. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Wow. Wow. Jesus proclaims the works of his father in John 10. In John 11, he fulfills the works of his father. 1037, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. The works of his father come in John 11. 1144, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Look at the works of the Father. They're right there in Isaiah 58, 6. Is not this the fast that I, the Father, have chosen to loose the bands? Let the oppressed go free? Is that not what Jesus is doing? Is he not doing the works of the Father in John 11 that he spoke of in John 10? Amen. He does them. Amen. Now watch this. This is where we're going to close out the cellular reproduction of John 10, which manifested immediately in John 11. You have 42 verses in John chapter 10. In John chapter 11, you have 57 verses. You put those two chapter verses together, you have 99, as in the 99 sheep oh, of Luke 15. <laughs> what man among you, what man of you having an hundred sheep, that's the John 10 sheepfold sheep. If he lose one of them, that's Lazarus. In John 11, he's the one. He's that 100th. If he lose one of them, doth not leave the 99. This is him exiting John chapter 10, where he talks about all the sheep in the sheepfold and the sheep that are following him. He leaves John chapter 10 to go into John chapter 11 to get the one missing one, Lazarus. This Bible is no joke, guys. And anybody watching this on YouTube, people are going to heaven and people are going to hell on this word right here. Yes, sir. So we want to encourage you to take this as the sincerity of his highest. Amen. Amen. Now, I do have a Mark 6 to Revelation, but I need to check my time. What, what is my time allowance at this point? How long have I been going? Okay, I've got time. <laughs> now what we're going to look at is how this is going to go from book to book. This mitosis and meiosis of the scriptures, the living word of God, raising itself up through this cellular reproduction. That's what any living organism does. You will not have a living organism that does not follow this. Therefore, the word of God must also as well be inclined to that law of the spirit of life. We're going to look at how one chapter, we're only going to be in Mark chapter 6, is going to develop and lay out and put forth its genetics to propagate the entire book of Revelation. Now, you don't have to take this all in doctrinal application. You just need to understand that this is what the Word of God is doing to provide its content. Its content is growing out of itself. Here we go. We begin the book of Revelation. I'm sorry, we begin Mark chapter 6 and the book of Revelation, but we begin, we begin the book of Mark chapter 6 with uh, verse 1, and he went out from thence and came into his own country. And when the book of Revelation opens up, what we see that his revelation is set with the Lord returned to heaven. That is his own country. He says in John 8, 23, I am not of this world. So when the book of Revelation opens up, he is in his own country. Amen? Amen. Amen? Verse 2, And when the Sabbath day was come, look at the book of Revelation. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is on the cusp of the Sabbath millennium. In other words, we have X amount of millennium. Christ comes in the fourth millennium. The church has been around for two millennium. When Jesus returns, he's going to inaugurate the seventh millennium as the prince of peace for a thousand years. And when the Sabbath day was come, so it is the Sabbath millennium. Revelation is the cusp right there to trigger the entering into that seventh millennium as you go through the great tribulation into the reign of the prince of peace, the king of kings and the lord of lords. 
Now keep in mind, the scriptures tell you one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. This is why we're seeing the seven days of creation of Genesis 1 as being a seed that's going to bear its genetics and going to grow into a 7,000 year disclosure. Verse 7, we're in Mark 6. We're only going to be in Mark 6. Verse 7, and he called unto himself the 12. Look at verse 7 in uh, chapter 7 of Revelation. It's what it's going to grow into. So we see that that verse position, number 7, is even growing into the chapter number here. The 12 will become 12,000 from each tribe. You see how 12 reproduces into 12,000? These are they which follow the Lamb, and that's Revelation 14.4, 4, and you have 144,000, 144, 144. These are genetics that you're looking at. When people tell you these numbers in the Bible, you can't listen to those numbers. They don't understand genetic marking, genetic markers. They don't understand that there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Verse 7 of Mark 6, and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power. Now compare that with Revelation 11. Compare the two witnesses here. And I will give power. See that? Gave them power in Mark 6. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Amen. Revelation 11.3. Revelation 11.3 has grown out of Mark 6.7. And whosoever shall not receive you, we're in verse 11 of Mark 6, nor hear you when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. See that shall not receive you underlined and Sodom underlined? Look at Revelation chapter 11 about those two witnesses. Notice this in the verse 11 slot. This prophecy of the two witnesses rejected and killed in Sodom. Just like it said there in Mark 6, 11 about the disciples that Jesus was sending out. By twos, two and by two. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom, there it is, in Egypt. He sends them out by twos here, warns about Sodom. And then in chapter 11 of Revelation, there it manifests in its finality. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Verse 12. Revelation 9.20, 16.9. And 1611 in Revelation, all three above scriptures say they would repent not. And that last time, you want to talk about anisotropy and anisotropic viewing of the scriptures. Here, we're talking about the focus is on Israel. And yet, with this 1611 marker, there's another cross cut to view. That that final Bible which came was rejected that Bible that came to the Gentiles. Amen. There's still a lingering aspect of the fellowship of the mystery going on here. Man will not repent to receive God's King James Bible. Amen. Now get this. In verse 13 of Mark 6, and they cast out many devils. Now compare that with Revelation 12, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Look at Mark verse 13, and then look at Revelation 12, 4. One third of the stars cast out. You see the match there? One third of the angels, and they cast out many devils. One, three. These genetic markers are very strong. Very, very strong. Herod. The king who orders the beheading of John the Baptist in verse 16 of Mark. Compare with the Antichrist of Revelation who beheads the saints in Revelation. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Herod is a picture of the Antichrist. He was seated in the Gospels, revealing 
that man of sin to come. Herod made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee, Mark 6.21. You compare that with this occurrence in Revelation 19, 17, and 18. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper, supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, lords, kings, and flesh of captains, captains, and the flesh of mighty men, chief estates, right there. This Bible is self-perpetuating itself. And you have a role in this as well. You're written in here, guys. You're written in here. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, verse 22 of Mark 6, you have a picture of compare that with the great harlot who rides the beast. Herod would be the beast. She is entertaining. Salome is entertaining him unto great pleasure. We don't even know the extent of that. I'm not trying to be graphic, but she is a harlot riding a beast. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now get this. Pay close attention to this because I'm not just revealing these things to you. I'm imparting to you I salve spiritually so that you can start to see all of these things on your own because we all have anointed eyes in here. We have the mind of Christ. We have the eyes of Christ too. The king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, that's once, and I will give it to thee. And he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, that's twice, I will give it to thee unto the half of my kingdom. There's a half. And she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? That's the third time. You have three and a half. A three and a half right here. And she said, the head of John the Baptist. You see that? This is the three and a half years of the great tribulation in Revelation worded by King James as a time, times, and a half a time. Time, times is time and time, and a half a time. These are all markers. Amen. 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 And he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. The half of the kingdom is the right hand of power. You need to go back to Joseph for this and to understand. And when Joseph was made to be at the right hand of the Pharaoh, he was being given basically half of the kingdom. And that right hand is going to go to the beast. Now get this, and again, we're asking why? Why is something pertaining to the church appearing in literature pertaining to the Jews? And again, there is an anisotropic quality. There are things that God doesn't want you to forget. There's angles that he wants you to see it as versus angles he doesn't want you to see it as. But watch this, and brought his head in a charger, verse 28 of Mark 6. This is a decapitated head. This focuses the forehead upon which goes the mark of the beast and causes all to receive a mark in their foreheads. The decapitated head becomes a focus of the forehead, revealing Mark's uh, disclosure in advance. If you look into the fine genetics, of the 666 coming in Revelation 13. And watch. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. What do we have here? We have a headless body. We have a headless body. Christ is in heaven. The body is on earth. We are a headless body in that sense. They came and took up his corpse. Headless body took up is the headless body of Christ on earth, translated from earth to the throne room, Revelation 4.1. Connect that back with what you saw in Revelation 1 and the anisotropic workmanship of God in the scriptures there. Revelation 4.1, come up hither, Christ the head coming to take up the body. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, verse 30 in Mark 6. You see that? This is your second witness 
to the translation of the church from Revelation. The body gathers itself to Jesus, who is the head. The translation of the church, the body gathers to the head. When we are translated, we are going to be gathered, taken up, joined to the head. Now, this is not to say positionally we are not joined, or in life we are not joined. Certainly we are. I can only see these things because I am joined to the head. There is nothing of myself being produced here. But you can see the genetic markings and the imageries as the scriptures are pushing forward and manifesting to their completion. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Compare that with Revelation. This verse from Mark 6 follows the martyrdom of John. So you're reading that right after the martyrdom of John. That's important. That's your major indicator. Right after the martyrdom of John, you're reading that. And what do we have right after the martyrdoms in Revelation 6? The martyrs are under the altar and they're told to rest yet for a little season. Rest a while. See, martyrdom following is coming rest. And here you have martyrdom following is coming rest for a short time. See how it says a little season and a while? See how exact? This is total cellular reproduction. He cometh unto them walking upon the sea. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, two times, verse 48 and 49 in Mark 6, compare that with the sea of glass that Jesus and the saints walk on in Revelation. And you'll notice that it occurs in Revelation exactly two times to match the two times in Mark 6 right there because it is a cellular reproduce. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass. And them that had gotten the victory over the beasts stand on the sea of glass. That's Revelation 15, 2. Two references in Mark 6 and two references in Revelation 4, 6 and 15, 2. So in 4, 6, Jesus is standing on the sea of glass. That's, that's what Jesus was experiencing. You know, we talk about the word of God being quick and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, Jesus is willing to let you know what his thought life was when he walked on the earth, when you get into this word. Amen. You know, when he was walking on the Sea of Galilee, his thought life was the Sea of Glass that he had come from. He knew that in walking that out, he was replicating his DNA for the scriptures for to come. Every step he took was a necessary step to manifest the scriptures because he was the word of God. Amen. His shadow, you could say, or his footprints on the ground, all of those were just lending to the maturing of the word of God through history and time in a way that we can't begin to even comprehend, but this shows it true. Amen. <laughs> okay, for they all saw him and were troubled and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Of course, that was John's encounter. We covered that already. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Jesus says to him, fear not. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets. And as many as touched him were made whole. That takes place in Mark 6. You can compare that with the tree of life in the street for the healing of the nations in the midst of the street. And on either side of the river was there the tree of life for the healing of the nations. When Jesus was walking through these streets in Mark 6, his thought life was, I am the tree of life. As he imparted healing to the people who were on the sides, just like on every side was the tree of life. He thrived in his identity. He thrived in it. Amen. Amen. We're almost at the end here. Bear with me one minute. Of course, we have the gospel according to Mark is what we've been looking at. And what is the most famous theme of the book of Revelation? Is it not the mark of the beast 666? And of course, we have been examining chapter 6 of Mark, which is going to then reproduce itself. Just like we saw with Genesis 1, 11, a 1, beginning a 1, beginning a 1, everything after its kind... Here we're seeing that Mark chapter 6 is begetting a 6, begetting a 6. 
Amen? Amen. This is the power of the King James Bible. This is the power of God, and this is how he raised the Bible. And this is the nature of the Bible. Amen. Amen.